I was without doubt the most disruptive person that has ever been in the European Parliament and they just couldn't cope with me. <laughs> Today we are interviewing the very disruptive politician Nigel Farage. Would you run for Prime Minister? Look, I think the whole thing should be changed. I mean, I'm a radical. But I'm a genuine You're a radical. Disruptor. He rants about the government, the broken economic and tax system. These various lockdowns of the implication to small businesses and the no, economy in a long term. No, no one cares. It doesn't exist. You don't understand how this country is run. Have you seen the Muppets on the front bench of the Labour Party and the Conservative Party? We turned ourselves into the cheap labour capital of the European time zone. We relied on imported migrant labour at every level and we de-skilled in our own country. That means your bills will keep going through the roof. Let's get straight in, but just before we do, make sure you like this video, subscribe to the Disruptors channel and turn the notification bell on. I think we've got one of our most disruptive <laughs> guests. <laughs> um, Nigel Farage, thanks for joining the show. Thank you. Yes, I'm a disruptor. If I, I was without doubt the most disruptive person that has ever been in the European Parliament in the history of its existence, and they just couldn't cope with me. <laughs> but I wasn't doing it just for the hell of it. The point about disruption, whether it's economic disruption, whether it's social disruption, or in my case, political disruption, you're not doing it just to cheese everybody off. You're doing it actually because you think the status quo, as it is, needs shaking up, needs breaking up, because you believe something better can come along. And I often think this word disruptor, it's kind of used in a sort of pejorative term. You know, Donald Trump was a disruptor. That means he must be a bad guy. Mm -hmm. And somehow the status quo is always good. And I think there's so much about our country today. So much that is good, but so much that I think a lot more disruption is needed in this country, uh, you know, politically, socially, the rich get richer, people on average salaries. You know, there's so much needs to change. So, yeah, I, you know, I tell you what, rebranding it the way you have, let's give the word disruptor a good name. Amen. Thank you, Nigel. <laughs> so um, I think we could go on for about a week and we've got a hard stop. <laughs> so what we try and do on this show is do things a little bit differently. So we often have little themes or chapters or sections. So we've got three sections to this. Mm -hmm. Politics, platforms, and people, with a little bit of a bonus Nigel session at the end. Oh gosh, there we are. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I understand, Nigel, that you've been quite open about saying you won't obey any more lockdowns. Is that true? And yes. Where are yeah. we at with all this? Yeah, enough's enough. I mean, look, when this thing first came on the horizon, and by the way, it did come from that lab in Wuhan. I've got no doubt about that. Uh, so funny. you definitely don't think it's a conspiracy? You think it's real? Well, the conspiracy was not talking about it. Right. You know, Donald Trump said, I think it came from that. Well, if he says it, it must be wrong. Yeah. Uh, now it turns out that senior British and American scientists deliberately did not talk about the fact that it had leaked from a lab because they didn't want to damage Chinese science, which meant they didn't want to damage their future income prospects. Mm. Um, when it first appeared, we had no idea. I had friends in Milano, in northern Italy, where I'd had business in, in, in a previous life, and it looked blooming horrendous. You know, people queuing outside ICU, lack of beds. I didn't object to the first lockdown at all. We needed to buy time. We needed to find out exactly what this thing was, how we could deal with it. I think after a few weeks, you know, I mean, frankly, by the middle of May 2020, you know, we were down to very, very few case rates in London. Uh, medically, we were beginning to understand that it affected the elderly, it affected the seriously obese, it affected those who've got immune dysfunction, but then you know, flu kills 20,000 a year of people in those categories. Um, and I think we went into, we, we stayed in lockdown for far too long. I think our thinking was dominated by the public sector. You work in the civil service, work from home, have a beer in the garden, what's not to like? What about the private sector? What about the entrepreneurs? What about people out there, you know, running their own businesses, taking risks? So I think, I think that the, the whole thinking behind it was London-based, public sector-based. I think it went on for far too long. And I managed to escape um, in 2021. I just I couldn't put up with it anymore. So I escaped. I went to America for two months. Uh, I had to quarantine for a fortnight to get into America. Wow. A fortnight in the Caribbean on the way in. Sounds glamorous. I got bored as hell. <laughs> you know, I mean, I mean, drinking with the expats is good for the first two nights. It soon wears off, yeah. you know. Um, and I went to America for two months. And I toured America for two months, sort of giving speeches and doing things. And really interesting, going to Florida to see how they approach this and go to California to see how they approach this. 
Two states with mega populations, two states with very, very similar climates, one rigidly locked down, the other not locked down at all. Yes, there were precautions. You went to a restaurant, they took your temperature, made you wash your hands, you know, things like that, regular testing, all of those things. And what we've learned, actually, is that we can live with this, that closing everything up, locking down, doesn't work anyway. I think Sweden have proved this. And I'm pleased to say now, in this country, we're taking a much more relaxed approach than perhaps many of our former European partners are. And yeah, I'm not prepared for uh, my liberties to be given up on a permanent or semi-permanent basis. So if they try and lock us down again, I will defy. <laughs> You've heard it here. <laughs> I will defy. Do you not get scared about being branded a racist? Well, hang on a second. Telling the truth about Black Lives Matter cost me a lot in terms mm. of being cancelled from various things. Mm. But it was the truth. Do you think enough thought went into when we did these various lockdowns and soft lockdowns of the implication to small businesses and the no, economy in a long term? No, no basis? one cares. No one cares. There's no such thing as small business. It doesn't exist. You don't understand how this country is run. Have you seen the Muppets on the front bench of the Labour Party and the Conservative Party? Not one of them. Not one of them has ever worked in a small business. Not one of them has ever set a small business up. And even those that you're told from the world, world of business, like Rishi Sunak, yeah, Goldman Sachs, hedge funds, corporates. The difference, I mean, this is, um, this is a, a debate I'm keen to have with you today. The difference between the corporate mentality of business and the small business, the entrepreneur, the medium sized. There are something like six million people in the UK who run their own limited companies as directors or act as sole traders, but six million roughly self-employed. If you think about it, they're actually all entrepreneurs because they're all doing their own thing. There's no sick pay or horribly pay for these people. You know, they're out there giving it a go. And they are, I think they are the most ignored, uh, almost looked down upon in, in London. But if they fund pretty much the entire public sector, why are they looked down upon so much? Um, oh, it's business, it's grubby. It's all, it's all a bit grubby. I mean, I mean, do, I mean, do you realise some of these people running businesses didn't even do Latin? Um, <laughs> I actually did, but it makes no difference. But the point I'm making is, you've got to remember this, Rob. I spent over 20 years as an elected member of the European Parliament. I've lived and worked and breathed inside the political class that runs the Western world. I know these people. There is a complete disconnect with the world of entrepreneurship, with the world of business. They think having dinner with the boss of a FTSE 100 company who probably has never been, a, never been an entrepreneur in his or her life and is more like a civil servant or a PR man or woman, they think, they, they, oh yeah, we've met business. Right. You know, and, and, and that isn't it. So it's massively underrepresented. It's deeply disappointing. And I, and I want to make this political point, if I can. I set up my own business in the first few weeks of 1994. Uh, so, you know, I, I, before politics, for 10 years or so, ran my own company, employed my own people, you know, did the VAT returns and all the things out there that people do when they're running businesses. So I came into politics with an understanding of what it was like in the real world. And I saw no, every time uh, there was a new piece of legislation going through the European Parliament, all of which of course direct, directly impacted the UK, again and again I'd get up and say, has anybody here ever actually run a business? Have you actually thought through? You know, it all sounds wonderful because it's for health and safety and the environment. I mean, who could be opposed to motherhood and apple pie? But have you ever thought of how this actually impacts on people? And, 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 and nobody ever did, and nobody ever understood it, uh, and it's a real, real problem. Uh, and I, I think this, I think one of the points of Brexit was that we had over nearly half a century accumulated, you know, Estimates vary, but let's call it 150,000 pages of close type legislation that everybody had to abide by. One of the things about Brexit that I wanted was a mass simplification of those rules, a removal of those that we thought unnecessary. You know, supply side reform would be the classic economic term for this. <clears throat> and one of the big disappointments is we haven't yet done that. There's so much we can do to help small businesses with Brexit that we couldn't do as members of the European Union. Now, when I question the government on this, they say, well, we've been busy with the pandemic. Well, all right. You know, I do accept that it's been a major challenge, but that's what we need to do in this country. We've, you know, we've gone for Brexit. When you make a fundamental change, 
There are winners and losers, always. In, in, you know, in all forms of life, there are winners and losers. But the big upside for small business is simplification, firstly, of European law, and secondly, the taxation system. I mean, the tax code, I'm told it's now over 14,000 pages long. We have wow. one of, Yep, we have one of, one of the longest and most complex tax codes in the whole of the world. And one of the things that small businesses have to do necessarily is spend a lot on accountancy fees every year just to survive, oh. just to keep going. And, and you know, I'm not saying overnight we go to a flat tax system or anything like that, but I do think, uh, I do think that our tax system is way, way too complicated. Okay, so that's opened three questions in my mind. I'll try and do them one at a time. So I am one of those business owners. Mm -hmm. We employ about 250 people. In our offices, it's nearly 100. On our construction sites, it's not far off that. And then outsourcers. And of course, there was no reduction in VAT. There was an increase in corp tax from 19 to 25%. My income tax is 45%. There's a 12.5% increase in national insurance. I pay business rates and yada, 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 yada. Yeah, everyone's saying all oh, the rich people don't pay tax. Well, actually, they pay yeah, all those taxes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh and, oh, and dividends are going up too. Dividend tax is going up as well. Nigel, this is supposed to be a positive <laughs> oh, well, no, no, Don't bring the bad news. <laughs> so dividend yeah. tax is going yeah. up. Yeah. So all this happened. Now, in lockdown 1.0, there was obviously furloughing and there were grants, etc. And, you know, look, I, I, it must have been difficult in government to handle this. But since then, there's been really nothing. And thankfully, I've kept the business going. I've got enough of a capital yeah. float. But hairdressers, bars, pubs, clubs, restaurants, Gone. gyms. Gone. Dead. Yeah. Why is there not financial support? Why is there not grants and delays of tax? And yeah. Well, we're back to where we were five minutes ago with me saying to you there is a complete misunderstanding of how, of how the small and medium price enter enterprises actually operate. So it's not country. because they haven't got the money. It's because they don't want to support them. They just they don't want to support them. In fact, the opposite. Rishi Sunak, in one of those budgets, not the one, this one, the one before, gave a sort of warning. He said, and the self-employed will have to start paying their fair share of tax. You know, and you've just listed the taxes that the self-employed, those running their own companies pay already. Uh, and I thought it was a very, very, very sinister thing. And, and by the way, this is from a government who have the cheek to call themselves conservative. <laughs> I mean, this they is were getting the, paid by the I private mean, sector. Yeah, look, I mean, this is the one thing, and I, and I, I know this name drives some people crackers. Donald Trump. But, but no, 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 that really drives them. <laughs> but, but in you know Margaret Thatcher, and it's you know north of Watford, everyone goes ah. But actually, you know, she grew up above the corner shop, which her dad ran. She understood small and medium prize enterprises, and she and Reagan simultaneously in the eighties made life easier for people to be self-employed, massively reduced super taxes, gave people incentives. On your tax point, I mean, here's the point, right? The richest 1% of taxpayers pay 30% of the total tax take. 1% paying 30%. Don't tell me mm. that high earners and the well-off are not paying their fair share of tax in Britain. Mm. They absolutely certainly are. The problem, and here is the real problem, is since 2008, since the sort of very near banking collapse that we had. Uh, government have pursued policies, and I get too technical here, but we've, we've basically gone through a period of quantitative easing. Basically what government have done is they've pumped the price of assets. They've pumped by increasing the money supply. They've, they've pumped the price of property. They've pumped the price of equities. So those who actually had stuff have seen a large level of appreciation. And those who might have had reasonable incomes but didn't have assets have relatively suffered. And now that we've got inflation, which, which I believe is back to stay, by the way, I, I, I think they've misread this. I think the Bank of England misread this. I mean, Boris in October was saying, don't worry your poor little heads about inflation. Well, hey, it's going to be 7% by spring. But it's not going to be 7% in reality. No. If they, if they don't put food and no, other things course, into of, it. Of it's course. going to be double digit of, in reality. Of well, it is now. Yeah. I mean, if we're being honest about it, it is now. But, but they always mess around with the basket of what makes it up. Yeah. So, so here's, the, here's, the, here's the perception problem about the rich. Yes, mistakenly, some people think, I think rich, you know, high earners, whatever you want to call it, that, that mistakenly people think they're not paying their fair share of tax. They are, but those with assets have benefited massively from government policy and ordinary folk have paid the price. And there is something fundamentally wrong with that. 
um, and it's got to be addressed. What did you think of Harry and Meghan going on Oprah? Disgusting. Biggest insult to the Queen there ever could have been. Total lack of gratitude. A series of claims that were made that proved to be false, false, false. Where can we go then from here? How can we improve the tax system? And how can, where's the economy going to go if we're not careful? And how can we, you know, make the best of coming out of this? Right. Um, back to tax. Simplification is the first thing. I mean, you know, for all of us, I mean, look, you know, any accountants watching this will hate this. But, but, <laughs> but, but you know, we're all having to pay accountants a lot of money because we can't possibly do our own tax returns anymore. It's too difficult. And if you're in trouble and in breach, you know, they make your life murder, and, and, and none of us dare do that. So I think the simplification of a tax system is really, really important. Um, do you I think, think it's complicated? Sorry to interrupt, Nigel. Yeah. Do you think it's complicated? Well, let, let me. I, I spoke to Peter Schiff a couple of days ago. He's been on Joe Rogan four times. Yeah. He's been campaigning in the America to have a much smaller government. He thinks there's far too many people, wow. and a lot of the money that goes in is paid on the politician salaries. And there's all this red tape and all these tens of thousands of pages worth of documents and policies and stuff. And that all takes a load of money. So do you think there might be resistance to this because... Well, here's the problem. You see, government's got bigger and bigger and bigger. And during the pandemic, government has reached levels it didn't even reach during the war in terms of what it can do mm. in your life. Um, yeah, I, um, again, you see, we've got a conservative government, well, in name only, uh, who are behaving like a big socialist state government. And uh, yeah, of course, if government's paying for everything, you know, then the percentage of the economy that's in the public sector and not the private sector gets bigger. We need to turn that round, but it's mm. gonna need radical political leadership to do that. And actually, that's what Thatcher did. That's what Thatcher mm. did, because kind of in the 50s, 60s, into the 70s, kind of the Conservative and Labour parties have become very, very similar. You know, they'd all become high tax, they'd all become big state. I mean, just a quick reminder, not a reminder, most, actually most of your, most of your um, people out there won't remember this, because they weren't around. 1979. I was born that year. Right, okay. What was the top rate income tax in 1979? 90%. 83% yeah. on earned income. 98% on unearned income, all right? These were massive disincentives. Yeah, that's what it was. If you earned more than 38,000 pounds a year, in 1979, it was 83% income tax. So Thatcher came in and turned it all around. So Schiff is right, in a sense. We do need to reduce the size of government, but that then means there's not quite as much welfare as there was before. And people are always crying out for more and more welfare. And, 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 and these are very difficult, and very, very thorny issues. But you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm an old style free marketeer. I believe in a civilized society. I believe in a safety net for those that can't look after themselves. Of course I do. Uh, but I worry that the sheer size of social security, the sheer size of the state, has actually through the tax system become a glass ceiling on aspiration rather than a safety net mm. for those who've fallen on hard times. Surely, if these tax keeps going up, production's going to go down, personal incentives going to go down, all the people that create all the jobs and do all the engineering and advanced society are going to have less well, incentive. I mean, look, productivity, um, our productivity is shameful. You know, by some measures, our productivity is below the French. I don't quite believe it, but that's what the sub goes with. <laughs> After lunch, what happens in France, you know? But, but the... Bonjour. <laughs> oh, that starts early. Yeah. <laughs> used to make me laugh. I mean, I went to Strasbourg every month for, ne for nearly 21 years. And there's a big department store in the center of Strasbourg. And at lunchtime, it closed so the staff could go for lunch. <laughs> Back on that's when all the customers are around. Yeah, yeah. Productivity's been bad. Look, we, what we've done, let's be frank about this. We've de-skilled the British population. We've sent them to university in their droves when many of them should never have gone near a university. We've encouraged them to take degrees in a variety of ologies, which are frankly not much use to any of them in the workplace. Uh, we have looked down upon trades and skills. We've looked down upon people who want to be carpenters, plumbers, master joiners, whatever it may be. Ironically, they're really needed right now. Oh, and, <laughs> and, the, ones, and the ones that have got the skills are doing they're that. They're loving it. Their oh, prices are way up. goodness. <laughs> I mean, look at Pimlico plumbers. Look at Pimlico plumbers, mm. just as one example. You know, 25% of the people working for Pimlico plumbers earned more than 150,000 last year, and some of them a lot more than 150,000. So, you know, there is good income in those trades. What we did, is under, the, under New Labour, and supported by Cameron and others, we turned ourselves into the cheap 
labour capital of the European time zone. We relied on imported migrant labour at every level and we de-skilled in our own country. That needs a radical rethink, not just in the construction industry but also the tech sector as well. I'm pleased to say, at least in tech, uh, there is now money coming into this country, a lot more than is going in to France and Germany. But a complete rethink about how we educate young people. Uh, the other thing, and this is more difficult, is, you know, when I left school, I was filled with ambition. You know, I want to go on, I want to succeed, I want to make money, I want to have a great car, you know, all those kind of things. You meet an awful lot of young people today with almost no ambition at all. They want to be happy. Well, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, maybe I'm getting this wrong. <laughs> but, I, but I mean, where's the work ethic? Yeah. Where's the work ethic? I More mean, bank holidays, yeah. let's say. Oh, where's yeah. the work ethic? I mean, look, I have for the last 15 years or more, nearly everyone that works for me is 30 years younger than me because I recognise that the tech side of things was the way messaging and communication was going. Mm. Um, and I've had some great young people that work for me, you know, and, and yeah, if, if, well, I say for me, with me. That's the point, with me, as a team. And yeah, if stuff's kicking off, I, I will ring them at midnight and expect them to answer the phone. No, I will. Yeah. But if stuff's not kicking off. These guys will tell you that. Yeah. <laughs> they get yeah. emails at five well, in the morning. Yeah, but if stuff's not kicking off, well, let's go out and have a few drinks. Or, you know, take a long weekend. Mm. Or that's how I see things. But there's so many young people that I've worked with in the last 15 years who haven't lasted the course because they think that if you call them after five o'clock, somehow that's breaching their human rights. I just don't get it. And I, are, you know, you, are you referring to countries that made it illegal to contact staff after office hours? Yeah. I had a rant on that, got a good few hundred thousand views. I mean... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so, but, 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 if, but if, you, if, if, you, if you inculate young people with this thinking that it's wrong you know, that you have to have a work-life balance and all this business. Uh, you are stripping them of ambition. Mm. And I meet so many young people today who are not ambitious that it really shocks me and worries me. Quite how you turn that round, I'm not sure. Mm. I mean, work that out. The Taliban are still tweeting and Trump is banned. So we now have a very major problem. Mm. I think you said that the government is the biggest threat to small business. Yes. Yeah. My business partner had exactly the same conversation with me. Um, and it's definitely been a rude awakening of how one, you can wake up one morning, read BBC News and oh, everything's I, changed. I wouldn't do that. No. <laughs> <laughs> or whatever new, GB News. Well, they, whatever. <laughs> G, GB News is much better. <laughs> um, how do we not just survive, but end up coming out and thriving and prospering beyond lockdown? Here's the irony. The irony of how badly run we are. The irony of this disconnect that I'm talking about between Whitehall, uh, Westminster, and the real world out of strivers out there. The irony is that despite the difficulties, despite the lack of understanding, there are still millions of us out there endeavoring is it five, six million, something yeah, like that? Yeah, getting on with all six million. Yeah. It's still happening. The entrepreneurial spirit of this country is actually still there. Uh, I think the we're still way behind America, but I think the growth in tech that we've seen over the last couple of years is very, very encouraging. Um, my criticisms, my upset, is because I want it to be even better. All right? But you will never crush the entrepreneurial spirit of a decent percentage of the British population. What I want to do is have a system that number one, makes it easier for them, and number two, encourages more people to have a go. I mean, what about saying to young people, not the state's gonna give you this, and the state's gonna give you that, and you must wear a face mask, or you must. What about saying to young people, follow your dreams? There's not enough of that. Mm, I agree with that. So, Nigel, if it were on the table, would you run for Prime Minister? So, so I'm going to give you a proper answer to that, because I get this As question. As opposed to a fake one. <laughs> <laughs> I get this question every day. You're passionate about this. I get this question every day. Right, so, and, and in America particularly, in America, you know, I've got a reasonable size following in the States. I mean, I, I just do, and I've spent a lot of time out there. A lot of my working life, my first job in 1982 
was for an American company. So most of my working life before politics was for American firms, New York, Chicago-based companies. Then in politics, inevitably, the Farage Trump disruptors <laughs> <laughs> came together. Um, and I'd been a contributor to Fox News, et cetera, et cetera, and so I was there for two months touring last year. So I have a following in America. All the Americans say, you've got to run for prime minister. Right, okay, here's the problem. In America, anyone can run for president. Literally anyone, well, provided they, you know, born in America and legally American and haven't got a serious criminal record. So in 2015, this real estate guy, this larger than life, real estate guy, mega popular, uh, running a TV show called The Apprentice, watched by huge numbers of people. Trump announces he's running for president. I mean, it's the funniest thing you've ever heard. Well, I mean, you know, has Trump gone nuts? He's got no chance at all, but here's the point. You can run as a Democrat or a Republican, you enter into a contest, you get people to nominate you, you have what are called open primaries where all the candidates appear on a stage in Illinois or, you know, in, in, in Alabama or whatever it is. And if those registered Republicans or Democrats like you, they can vote for you. And it goes through a series of rounds. So this complete outsider who hadn't got a catch chance in hell smashes the opposition aside <laughs> I mean, in the most dramatic way <laughs> and ends up being president. Right. If we had open primaries in this country, I'd have a go. Absolutely, but we don't. You know, I can't run for the Labour Party, because I, I, I don't believe in high taxes and big state. It doesn't work for me. Uh, lots of people in the old Labour movement who are very patriotic, very decent people, but it's not, my, it's not where I'm coming from. And it certainly doesn't support small business or any things like that. So naturally for me it would have to be the Conservatives. But the Conservatives don't have an open process. Do you know the Conservative Party wouldn't even let me be a member? Wow. Because they're so scared of me. Mm. You know, they're so scared of me. And they are! I might have given a good kicking a couple of times, I'm not surprised. <laughs> so what do I do? You know, because I mean, to be leader of the Conservative, I haven't been to Eton. You know, I haven't got a PPE degree from Oxford University. I mean, that's who we're picking as leaders. Look at it. You know, look at it. Um, it's, it's coming. Tory leaders are coming from a very narrow group of self-selecting people. So I can't run as a leader of the Conservative Party. I think, I'll be honest with you, I think from 2013, through to 20, mid-2019, I think if there had been open primaries for the Conservative leadership, I think I'd have made the last two at any moment during those six years. Would I have got to the top? I don't know. But I would have been part of that race, and I'd love to have done it, but it wasn't open to me. So all that's open to you is to lead a party on the outside. UKIP was an outsider party. The Brexit party was an outsider party. Reform is an outsider party. Funny thing is, 2014 European elections, I led UKIP, we won, came first nationally. 2019 European elections, Brexit party, came first, we won. So I have won two national elections leading two different parties, no one's ever done that before in the history of this country. But they were PR elections. They were proportional representation elections. General elections are still first past the post. So leading a UKIP, I was able to, by the way, not just me, tens of thousands of folk out there who believe passionately in this and got involved, the People's Army, as I called them, we were able to completely transform the political debate and narrative in this country and bring about constitutionally the biggest historic change for centuries. And we did it basically by getting millions of votes, frightening the pants off Westminster, getting a referendum and winning it. So I can influence from the outside, I can change national debates, but I can't become Prime Minister because the first-past-the-post system mm. just doesn't allow it. And that's the honest truth. Do you think that should be changed? Look, I think the whole thing should be changed. I mean, I'm a radical. I'm, 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 I'm a genuine You're radical. You're a disruptor. Well, look, House of Lords. Let's, I mean, you know, I, how can we have hundreds of Tony Blair, David Cameron, and Boris Johnson's financial backers and mates sitting in the House of Lords, a legislative chamber, and by the way, they all, live with it. they all live with inside the M25. They're all part of that very same metropolitan elite. House of Lords, gone. Uh, electoral system, yeah, a degree of proportionality. I want everyone that goes to vote to think their vote might just count for something. Not, it's a 20,000 majority, it's a 20,000 Labour or Tory majority. So I'd reform the electoral system, and I would do what the Swiss do, and I would give the punters out there the opportunity, if they think there's a major issue that the politicians have got wrong, 
I'd give them a trigger mechanism where they can call a national referendum. Mm. That would frighten the pants off of the Westminster. <laughs> but, that, but I think you know, our democracy needs to be brought into the 21st century, absolutely. Mm. Elon Musk said that the government is a monopoly um, and it has monopoly on violence and can incite violence legally. Um, and has no free market competition and therefore no accountability. Do you think that that's right? Well, I think that depending, I mean, look, you know, as I say, UK politics is pretty much a closed shop. It's very, very, I mean, honestly, I think people will look back in years to come and think what we did with UK was a miracle because everything's against you because effectively it's a closed shop. So on that point, I think Musk does have a point. Um, I don't know whether it can incite violence, government, but it can incite fear. Mm. And my goodness me, it's done that during and the course of this pandemic. It has, hasn't it? Yeah. And it's also a legally insolvent entity. Like, we have to run solvently yeah. as a business owner, otherwise that can be illegal, but isn't there an, a national debt? And isn't the deficit and the surplus not <laughs> balanced like well, it's supposed yeah. to be? Well, yeah, even worse, the European Commission and the auditors have not given the accounts a clean bill of health for 21 years in a row. So yeah, Musk is right with some of these things. Yeah. Um, he's right with some of these things, but I, look, you know, for centuries, governments have been profligate with our money. <laughs> I mean, let's be frank about that. Yeah. Uh, in this case, ever since probably the sort of Napoleonic Wars or whatever it was. Um, we need to have a system where we can get a grip on that. I mean, take, for example, net zero. The government's going for net zero. You know, that means your bills will keep going through the roof over the course of the next few years. Your house is going to have to have a heat pump. That will cost you 10 or 15 grand. Um, all of this is happening. Everybody in Westminster agrees. Now, that debate should be going on out there. It's a classic case. If you have the right system, you can actually beat the monopoly. Mm. That's the point. Yeah. The right system, you can deal with the monopoly. Right. Or, of course, as the very famous screaming Lord Such, leader of the official Monster Raving Loony Party, once said, why is there only one Monopolies Commission? <laughs> <laughs> so do you think big tech get a bit of favouritism from government then? Government's terrified of them. I mean, that's the truth of it. What do you think about Boris's, Boris Johnson's number 10 Christmas party? Boris has got through life um, being, the old word used to be economical with the truth. <laughs> I, I think the Boris Act is such, I don't think he knows himself what's true and what's not. I, he, he just, and I mean, I know people that work with him in the newspapers, in the Spectator magazine, and <clears throat> he would just blatantly say things that were totally untrue. Totally untrue. And it's never bothered him. And when he's questioned on things, he just laughs it off. And it's almost been part of his charm. You know, when he gets caught, the smirk. It's like the kid that's nicked a biscuit, you know? And, he, and he's been caught by Granny. <laughs> and, you know, it was the last custard cream on the plate as well. <laughs> and he knows Granny's gonna give him a telling off, but he knows Granny's not really gonna punish him at all. <laughs> and he's, but you know what I mean with Boris? It is that little smirk, isn't it, when he's been caught. You can, as an outsider, you can get away with a lot more than being Prime Minister through a national crisis. Think about Barnard Castle. Think about Cummings and Barnard Castles, where this first kicked off, pre-party, but, but you know, they're telling us, you're under house arrest, don't leave your house. You've got police helicopters looking for walkers in the Peak District, uh, people being given uh, tickets on Brighton Beach, and all the stuff that was going on. And let's get this right, shall we? Dominic Cummings drives 25 miles to Barnard Castle to test his eyesight. Well, I mean, it's just the most ludicrous excuse, clearly untrue. Do you know what? If he'd said, do you know what? I don't COVID. I've been blooming ill. The family have been ill. I've been through a heck of a tough few months. You know, Brexit, the crisis. It was my birthday. It was Easter Sunday. It was a beautiful day. And yes, we did as a family drive out, you know, and go for a walk in the woods and look at the bluebells and look at the rivers. And I'm sorry, but then who of you at home? hasn't perhaps bent the rules a bit. And we'd, and we'd all say, oh, he's, got a, <laughs> he's got a point, hasn't he? Yeah. But do you see what I mean? Yeah. That, 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 you, that, that you fess up, you know? And what Boris has done with the parties uh, is, frankly, 
to obfuscate or worse all the way through. I think he's misled the House of Commons by saying there were no parties. Uh, I think his refusal, the, now that the big one's come out, I mean, you know, the 20th of May is the big one. You, know, you could argue the others were after work with a glass of wine discussing the day. You can just about argue that. What you can't argue is an email that says, bring your own booze. <laughs> <laughs> you know, tables laid out with sausage rolls. Yeah. You know, um, and that on the day, the day when Oliver Dowden had done the five o'clock press conference and told us you may meet one other person outside. So you were allowed to meet a mate in the park at a two metre distance, all right? And here's a hundred people being invited to a booze up in number 10. And Boris, I think he's in great danger of being found to have lied to the House of Commons. I think he has been, proved himself utterly distrustful on it. Now, friends in the media say to me, oh, Nigel, it's all written in. Everyone knows he's a liar, so it doesn't really matter. No, it does matter. This actually does matter. And these heart-rending stories, we even saw one yesterday from an MP in the House of Commons, of people who couldn't see their family, couldn't say goodbye. Um, yeah, he's in real trouble. He can, can he save himself? Possibly. But he's got to completely open his heart and say, you know what, I'm a human being, I'm flawed, we're all flawed, I've made terrible mistakes, I've not been truthful with you. If he bears his soul... Do you think he will? No. No, I don't. I think he's just got away with the Boris Act for such a long time. I don't think he's capable of changing gear. And I think what will happen, well, who knows what will happen, but I, I'm guessing what will happen, if he gets through the next couple of weeks, which he may not, but if he gets through the next couple of weeks, there are the local English elections in May. They're going to get hammered. Mm. They're going to get hammered. People are furious. I don't know about you, but everyone's talking about it. You go in the mm. pub, this is what they're talking about. Um, and after May, they'll ditch him. Um, but it's, it's a funny thing, you know. The one thing I've observed in all the years I've been doing politics is there are two types of people in politics. There are those who want to be something and those who want to do something. And Boris always wanted to be something. He wanted to be prime minister when he was at school. It was, it was, it was the attainment of the job was what mattered. Mm. Whereas other people go into politics because they're driven, you know, by a sense of social justice, or in my case, freeing us from Brussels, or, and, and, and Boris fits into that, that classic career politician category. And I have a feeling, rather like Gordon Brown, it's all gonna end rather badly. Mm. Should Tony Blair have been knighted? You have your own platforms. Yes, I do. Um, you know, the modern politician has their own social media. Trump mm. and Barack Obama use social media very effectively. And then people like Trump obviously got de-platformed. Oh, so there's a bit of a paradox there. But firstly, let's talk about your channel, GB News, and you have a really good YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. And so how important has it been to have independent platforms away from mainstream media into social media and just tell us about the vision and maybe the disruption of GB News. Uh, YouTube made me. YouTube made me. I was elected to the European Parliament in 1999, <coughs> and I was doing my stuff over there. I was having great fun. Um, but it wasn't reaching a big audience, because the BBC didn't cover what I did very much or whatever. In fact, I was probably better known in, on the continent than I was here for mm. what I was doing. Suddenly, in 07, I hear about something called YouTube. What's that? Never heard of it. What's that? And then 2008, the financial markets crisis hits. And I'm getting up in the parliament and I'm talking about the fact that the North is going to need to keep bailing out the South because of the complete flaw in the model uh, that is the Eurozone. Um, and I remember, I remember one day in the parliament saying, if you look this morning at the difference in bond spreads, between German bonds and Greek bonds, that I said, oh, I'm sorry. Nobody here will understand what I'm talking about, will they? And <laughs> you see what they love me. <laughs> <laughs> and I gave that speech. Anyway, my brother rang me. My brother rang me about three hours later. He said, I've just seen your speech in the European Parliament. I said, you what? Yeah. He said, a New York firm called Zero Hedge, financial markets website, have picked up your speech, put it on YouTube, and sent it out to their subscribers. And it was the first time I suddenly realized what the impact of social media really could be. And it was the YouTube speeches that established me as a personality in the minds of the British people. The big one for me was in 2010. 
and that was the Herman Van Rompuy, the first president of Europe, and I said he was a damp rag and had the appearance of a low-grade bank clerk. It all went nuts, and they fined me, and, but that was watched by millions. So I realised, really, by 2008, this was the way forward, and I've invested more time and effort and money in the last couple of years um, with staff and making sure that it's managed. So yes, I have... Uh, I, was, I mean, I was doing you know, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, all of these things years before anybody else in this country was doing them. And still today, it's really interesting. If you look at, um, you look at the front benches, you know, the leader of the opposition, the leader of the Conservative Party will have a team of people managing their accounts. Once they leave office, they never post anything ever again. And, and, I, and so now I've taken it very seriously. I mean, by American standards, it's not very big. By pop music standards, it's not very big. But by current affairs standards, there's 3.3 million people across the platforms. Wow. Uh, that I've got, and I take it very, very seriously. Yeah. Here's the irony. Uh, the liberal lefties on the West Coast, who apart from Peter Thiel, but the liberal lefties on the West Coast who created all this stuff uh, allowed people like me, allowed the Brexit debate, allowed Trump to win, because the silent majority some, suddenly had somewhere they could go, and then in their horror, they now realise what they've created is something that actually beat the kind of politics that they support. I think the ban on Trump is absolutely unbelievable. I, I mean, the Taliban are still tweeting. I mean, work that out. The Taliban are still tweeting and Trump is banned. So we now have a very major problem. Uh, social media censorship. And all right, look, you know, there is a difference between free speech and incitement, and I totally get that. There are limits to free speech. There always have been, there always will be. But I think the shadow banning of conservative voices and everything else is really seriously bad news. There are new market players that are coming in. Uh, for example, Getter, Parler are coming into that space. Um, I wish them well. I mean, hey, if any, market needed, if any market right now needed competition, it is social media. Um, and I guess by that you mean big tech social media. Yes, exactly what I mean. Yeah. Yes, exactly what I mean. But you know, the investment in it, of course, has to be huge. Getting the, te getting the technology into the right place takes a very long time. Competing with Facebook and YouTube. And <laughs> yeah, no, no, yeah. it's very, very hard. Yeah. It's very, very hard. Now, you know, years ago, 110 years ago with Standard Oil, you know, the American government with the Antitrust Act got involved and broke it up. Mm. But then if you were to try and break up social media and you're the Democrats and you're in power, that's kind of biting the hand that feeds you. Mm. So I can't see radical reform happening in regulatory terms particularly quickly. So do you think big tech get a bit of favouritism from government then? Government's terrified of them. Mm. I mean, that's the truth of it. Yeah. Government's terrified of them. So for me, yeah, I'm stuck in the paradox too, in that it's been, without it, I could never have done what I've done, and I'm very grateful mm. to that, and I'm pleased that I recognised early what its potential was. But even now, when I'm posting stuff, I have to think, hmm, yeah, can I really do that? Um, you know, mm. it's uh, it's a it, it is a big, big problem. There will be there will be new competitors in this space, but it's going to take time. Mm. So let's just have one more question on that then. Yeah. I want to speak about some specific people because I think this is a fascinating moment in time we're in. Mm. Like you said, paradox. So Joe Rogan had mm. Robert Malone on his show, a scientist <laughs> talking about who I'm talking to in a few days' time about, you know, the, the science behind the vaccines, mm -hmm. immediately shut down off Twitter yep. and YouTube. Yep. Um, Donald Trump obviously completely shut down from Facebook and Twitter. Um, and there's more, David Icke. I interviewed David Icke and we got the video up, nearly a million views in five days, and then bang, shut down, and our entire YouTube channel shadow yeah. banned. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So where, where's the line yeah. here? Where does it go? Yeah, okay, well, I mean, I had Robert Malone on GB News. Right, I know none of the other UK broadcasters would dare touch it. I have been trying to push this debate. You know, by the way, I've had both jabs, but I haven't had the booster. And I'm really thoughtful now about whether I have the booster. And I've been sharing that with my audience most evenings on GB News. And so, thank goodness, at least with television, you know, the second part of your first question. Thank goodness with television, at least, at least, at least GB News is now having these debates. So I've had Robert Malone on, and it's very interesting because I have to provide balance for Ofcom. Mm. I mean, and actually, it's right that people sitting at home turning telly on do get balanced. Mm. They make their own minds up. So I had Robert Malone on giving his views. I then had a chap on 
you know, one of the former bosses of the Royal College of Surgeons, you know, top, 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 top draw, to provide the counterbalance to Malone. And he begins by saying, I have the most utmost respect for Robert Malone. His work in this field has been absolutely legendary. So <laughs> it was really quite interesting the way that it went. Um, where do you draw the line? Uh, David Icke, to my knowledge, has never incited violence, to my knowledge. Um, I would say, though, that some of the things that he said are pretty way out there on the conspiracy spectrum. As you say, where do you draw the line? It is very, very difficult with this stuff. It is very, very difficult. But I do think, around vaccines, I do think the way big government are bullying people, are making people leave the healthcare sector. I had a nurse on the programme on GB News last night who loses her job on the 1st of April. She doesn't want the vaccine. She's quite happy to be tested every day. So what's the problem? Mm. What's the problem? I mean, if you could say to me, you have the booster, Nigel, and you then can't catch COVID, and you can't spread COVID, I might then think pushing hard would be a good idea. All I get is have the booster, and if you get ill, you'll be less ill. Well, I'd be less ill if I didn't smoke 40 a day. You know, I'd be less ill if I wasn't 25, I'm not, but if I was 25 stone. But you see what I mean? Yeah. There are all sorts of health choices that we, or, or lifestyle choices that we make mm. that affect health outcomes. And, 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 and so I am standing up and fighting hard for the right of people to live a normal human existence as unvaccinated people even though I've been vaccinated myself. And mm. I think, that I think, you know, this is the, these are points about liberty, about freedom of choice, and actually back to where we started, about having a government mm. we really want to have and how much freedom mm. we want to have. So this stuff matters, and I think you'll find Malone very, very interesting. Mm. So if I could articulate that into a position, because I understand the sensitivity of this, mm. I personally think that everybody should be able to have their say, including David Icke. Um, but I think the line is where it causes harm to yes, people. Yes. And David Icke that I've seen hasn't caused any harm, and Joe Rogan certainly caused, hasn't caused any harm, and no. Robert Malone certainly hasn't caused any harm. Um, some people tell me that um, some of the big tech channels are driven by the advertisers, and the advertisers not wanting wow. certain... Well, you see, there we are. Now we're straight back. <laughs> to another conversation we had about corporate versus small business. The corporate world's gone crackers. Absolutely crackers. Even this morning, Terry Smith, the very successful fund manager, is, is, is attacking Unilever heavily, you know. Just, just to define, what does the corporate um, world has gone crackers mean? So, one of Unilever's products is Hellman's mayonnaise, right? So Terry Smith's argument as a major investor handling nearly 40 billion quid's worth of of uh, investors' cash, is your Unilever, just sell me Hellman's mayonnaise. Tell me it's good. Don't tell me by buying Hellman's we're saving the planet and we're all gonna have a great future. It's all this corporate social responsibility. We're doing this, we're doing that. When actually, all they're doing, really, is selling products. And it's the whole wokeness, it's the whole, Black Lives Matter is perhaps the best illustration I can ever think of. Here is an overtly Marxist, dangerous organisation that want to bring about the end of Western capitalism, defund police forces, and actually divide black people from white people by filling them with a sense of resentment about things that have gone wrong in our history and things that may be going wrong today. Uh, and yet, in the wake of George Floyd's death, you saw corporate brand after corporate brand endorsing and supporting Black Lives Matter. Complete and utter madness. And yet, for those of us back at the time that were standing up and saying this, I mean, they made our lives hell. Uh, and yet it was the truth, and yet the corporate world went with it. So I think the corporate world has really lost sight of what it is. Uh, it's become overtly political. Um, and I think that, ironically, uh, in the right environment, creates huge opportunities for small and medium-sized businesses. Mm. Yeah, the little disruptors. Oh, well, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. You know, when you see a consensus forming, among the big corporates, uh, that creates opportunity. Mm. Do you not get scared about being branded a racist or whatever by, you know, making <laughs> statements like that? Do you feel sometimes <coughs> misjudged? Well, hang on a second. You know, the reason I could talk on Black Lives Matter in this country is in, my, is in America, I'd come across them before. Um, and telling the truth about Black Lives Matter cost me a lot. Cost me a lot in terms mm. of being canceled from various things, mm. but it was the truth. And I didn't say it 
in an aggressive way. I said it in a purely factual way. I invited people to come back and argue with me and counter with me. Um, it's funny, you know. I get called racist a lot by people with names like Jago and Hugo and Sebastian and Jocasta. Um, sort of upper middle class white people, you know, filled with guilt because they live in daddy's five million pound house. Uh, I, <laughs> I mean, you know, they're the ones that tear down statues in Bristol and they're the ones that call you racist. When I go out in the community, with the black community, or people are always coming up and saying hello and let's have a selfie and all the rest of it. So look, you know, um, it, it, it's almost a sort of way of trying to close down debate. Throw abuse, call people this, call people that. It's pretty objectionable. I don't like it, uh, but I'm afraid that's, that's the tactic they use. Mm. And it was interesting because they tried to do this in my political career. Do you know what? They never succeeded because it wasn't true. Mm. Do you think Donald Trump will run for president in 2024? I do. You know, most people age during the presidency and never quite recovered. Got Bill Clinton and others, I mean, a Barack Obama, they're all worn out. But Trump looks great. But if he keeps harking on about what happened then, as opposed to how he's going to improve the system and make it better going forward, he'll make it difficult for himself. So we have, you have a hard yes, stop. So we I have, do. Uh, about 15 minutes to give you a couple of minutes debrief. Right. So now we're moving on to the people section. And yeah. then we've got, so these section, these questions can be much more quick fire. Fine. Um, but I reckon sort of one minute answer per question so is, is going to... This is like masterminds. Aren't yeah, it is. Exactly. <laughs> um, why did you go and visit Novak Djokovic's family and interview them? Because I know the family. I met the family when they were here at Wimbledon um, a couple of years back. And I had a couple of drinks with them, because I like doing that. Um, and, and I like them. Um, and they'd followed my political career in Brussels very closely. And I just felt that, again, you know, Djokovic was, he'd been arrested. You know, he'd met the criteria as, as laid out by the Victoria State Government and by Tennis Australia. He'd been arrested and put, and put into a detention centre. And I thought that was outrageous. Uh, I thought it was a big story that needed covering, so I went there as GB News to cover the story live and to get the first exclusive English interviews with the family, uh, and that's what I did, and I was very pleased that he won that case. Uh, since then, some other little difficulties have cropped up, and we'll see where the story goes. But I did it. I did it because, again, look, if you haven't had the vaccine, but you've been tested, you are no more risk though, to those around you than if you've been jabbed four times, as some in Israel, now have uh, and I feel very strongly about that. And what did you think? I know you had a ding dong with Andy Murray on Twitter. Yeah, poor old Andy Murray. He gets everything wrong, doesn't he? Really. Um, you know, I mean, you know, he 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 doesn't like the result of the 2014 Scottish referendum. He doesn't like the result of the 2016 Brexit referendum. Well, tough mate. That's where we are. He also seemed to think I was in Eastern Europe when I was in the Balkans. I mean, it's also misplaced. It's not true. And I did snap back a little bit at him, but I did give him a word of advice at the end of my tweet back to him. I think I read it. Yeah, do yourself a favour, mate, smile occasionally. <laughs> <laughs> I think, did you say, tell him to stick to tennis? I did. Yeah. I did, yes. I mean, I, I, did, I pointed out his shortcomings. I said, stick to tennis, but I ended happily by recommending that he smiles more with a little yeah. smiley emoji. I couldn't have been nicer, could I? <laughs> <laughs> um, Nigel, should Tony Blair have been knighted? All former prime ministers uh, are awarded the membership of the Order of the Garter. And with that comes a knighthood or comes an earldom, and that's what's always gone on. There have to be some very powerful reasons for that not to happen. And, and also there's a sense of timing. You know, Blair's been out of office now for, what, 13 years. Uh, I, I don't know whose decision this was, whether it was the Queen's, whether it was Boris Johnson's, um, but I think the timing of it couldn't have been worse. Uh, we, have a, we, have, we, have a, we have a platinum jubilee coming up next year for, the, for this woman, who by the way is the most respected human being living in the world today, and quite right too. Mm. Amazing the extent to which she's adored all over mm. the world. And, you know, you're English or British and they ask you about her and the family and all the rest of it. I think Blair should have used his political sense and turned it down at this moment in time because I deeply regret that the Queen herself is now getting some criticism over this. Mm. So. So you can argue the rights and wrongs of Iraq and whether we were lied to, we probably were, uh, and that in a way should disqualify him from it. But either way, um, if it was offered to him, 
he should have recognised that ahead of the Jubilee, this was a wrong thing to do. Okay. Should the government advisers through COVID have been knighted? No, they've all been, I mean, this is ridiculous. I mean, one minute he's telling us there's an emergency. Four times he used the word emergency three weeks ago. Well, that was more to save his political career than it was about COVID. But the next minute, I mean, they're all dames and knights and God knows what. Rather, not quite as funny though, as the Remain campaign. All of whom got honored. You know, the press officer got the CBE. I mean, can you see why I want to reform the House of Lords and change all of mm. this? It just doesn't work anymore. And, and here's the sad bit. You get MBEs given to people, you know, out in the community, who've given sometimes decades of charitable services, and it can be towards mental health or drug problems or diabetes or whatever it is. And we use this system to honor those people in our community. And that's a wonderful thing. It's a special thing for those people, their families, to get recognized. The local paper says, isn't it marvelous? And people are proud that their town's been mentioned or whatever it is. And all of that's ruined by cronyism and corruption that goes on within about two postcodes in, in uh, central London. Mm. My thoughts on it, uh, also, whether you think it's right or wrong, it's not finished. Well, that's a, yeah, of it's course. It's not even finished. <laughs> so. it's, it's rather like knighting a cricketer or a footballer when they're mid-career. Yeah. Better to wait till the whole thing's over. You know, um, knighting the England Ashes team after the first test yeah, instead well, no, of the whole. Well, 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 no, actually, the first ball it all went wrong. Yeah. But, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, yeah, mid. I mean, you know, if Boris says it's an emergency, why within a couple of weeks are they getting honoured? If, if if we've got such a long way mm. to go, actually, I think we are coming at the end of this. Personally, I, I'm, I'm feeling quite bullish. Right. About 2022, but That's no, I, inappropriate, wrong. Oh, and then he forgot. And then he forgot. How silly of me. There was also somebody from Pfizer got an award. Isn't that nice? Mm. Isn't that lovely? <laughs> Doesn't that warm the cockles of your <laughs> What do you mean by that, Nigel? Oh, no, it must have been a very miserable couple of years for Big Pharma. How ghastly for them. <laughs> okay, so um, do you think Donald Trump will run for president in 2024? I do, yes. He's 75 years old, which is young in American politics. Um, he, uh, compared to Joe. Um, no, he, I've been, I've been, I've seen him, I was with him, um, I was with him in the end of November, um, and I saw him a few months before that, uh, a few more times at Mar-a-Lago. I, he looks fitter and better than he did when he was president. You know, most people age during the presidency and never quite recovered. Look at Bill Clinton and others, I mean, a Barack Obama, they're all worn out by. Trump looks great. Trump looks great, but, and I am gonna say this, he keeps talking about November the 3rd and the conduct of that election. And I know from this country, the postal, I hadn't even started on this with you yet, the postal voting system, I mean, it's so bent, it's not true. So open to corruption and intimidation, it's not true. I get what he's saying. America had never seen large scale postal voting before. It is open to abuse. But if he keeps harking on about what happened then, as opposed to how he's gonna improve the system and make it better going forward, he'll make it difficult for himself. Uh, the Democrats are tied up in knots not just because Biden is just an incompetent fool, uh, you know, who, who shouldn't be anywhere near the presidency, not just of America, but because the leader of the free world too. They're in knots over everything else. You know, you, you've got the far left have infiltrated the Democrats rather like the Corbynites did with the Labour Party to make them unelectable. Uh, the Afghanistan debacle is one of the most humiliating, well, certainly the most humiliating things since the fall of Saigon for America. Um, there are lots of phenomenal opportunities for Trump to compare his record to Biden's record, but he just, I just think he and the Republicans need to move forward. Because I think this, people say, oh, you know, UKIP got this vote, that vote, UKIP's a protest vote. My, my voters weren't protesting. They were voting for change. They were voting for radical change, believing it could bring a better future. And if Trump gets back on that track, he'll win it in 2024 comfortably. You know Donald Trump. Do you think he's misunderstood? Oh, look, I just think he likes winding people up. <laughs> it's all Is that what you guys get on? Yeah, <laughs> he chucks a grenade over there and waits for the reaction. <laughs> Here's the funny thing about Trump, and I mean this, and some of your viewers won't believe me, but I've watched him with waiters, waitresses, drivers, staff. I've watched how nice and kind he is to people. I've watched him with ordinary people queuing up to have a photograph. 
the sort of thing that most politicians hate and can't wait for it to be over. Trump has a ball doing it. You know, he makes them feel a million dollars. I mean, he's one to one. He's brilliant. When you're with him, away from the crowd and away from the cameras, he's very funny. I mean, <laughs> is he very, very funny? Got a great sense of humour. I won't repeat any of it, but but, <laughs> but, but no, he is funny. Mm. And yet, when he goes on stage, you see, you see a lot of this. Mm. And I'd love to see more of the private Trump in public, and a lot of people would like him more for it. Mm. Look, he his analysis of many things is brilliant. Uh, I think a lot of what he did for America was great. I thought his foreign policy was stunning. I think bringing together Israel and those Arab states, even crossing the border into North Korea. You know, he was actually trying to turn an America who'd launched perpetual wars against everybody into a different kind of country. And I respect and admire that. And around the world, people do actually recognize that. But, uh, but yeah, you know what? Finally on Donald Trump, there's one reason why not everybody would ever get him, because he's a New Yorker. And New Yorkers, even in America, they think, oh, he's a New Yorker. Rather like in France, a Parisian. You know, they are a different type of person. They're very frank, they're very blunt, they're very out there. It's not everyone's cup of tea. Harry and Meghan, do you think they were... <laughs> <laughs> Take two. <laughs> what did you think of Harry and Meghan going on Oprah and what they did there? I won't put any words into your mouth. What Disgusting. do you think about that? Disgusting. Uh, the biggest insult to the Queen there ever could have been. Uh, the total lack of gratitude. Uh, a series of claims that were made that proved to be false, false, false. Uh, you know. Oh, the Archbishop of Canterbury married us in a back street alley. I mean, what are you talking about, woman? Virtually everything she said was wrong. She, of course, was the, was, was the first part of the interview. And then when he was brought in, when Laughing Boy was brought in for the last half, you know, and he's not always the sharpest tool in the box, I think. Uh, and when he openly contradicted some of the things Meghan had said, Oprah Winfrey didn't even pick him up on it. So it was a very poorly conducted interview, deeply insulting. Uh, I think Harry has made a most terrible mistake. Uh, and what I say to all the Americans, I want to do the speeches over there, I talk about trade. You know, you sell us Harley Davidsons and kind of we sell you, you know, English shoes from Northampton or whatever it is. I say, but our most recent export to you is a young couple who moved to the West Coast. I said, and they're yours for keys. They all go, no, I'm a Mac. back. Um, yeah, I, look, it's, 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 it's terrible. Um, Harry has dragged himself away from his family. Uh, the splits look to be irrevocable. It is an insult to the Queen. It's all very sad. She clearly wants a political career in America. The Democrats will probably give her that. <coughs> I'd be surprised if she wasn't in the House or the Senate within a couple of years. Uh, I don't think she'll do very well in politics. I don't think she's as clever as she thinks. Um, and I'll finish with a Trump quote on it. He was asked about this and he said, I wish Harry luck. I wish Harry a lot of luck. He's going to need it. Okay. Um, how would someone like Donald Trump or maybe Piers Morgan in the UK work out in UK government and politics? Well, it's not going to happen. As I, I, I've explained all this before. Because of the closed shop, there's no chance of people like them or me getting yeah. to the top. There is just no chance. It ain't going to happen. Okay. Um, we both defended Molly May uh, yes. of Love Island when she said everyone has the same 24 hours in a day. Why did you defend her? Because, uh, back to what I said to you earlier, I want young people to have dreams. Mm. I don't want young people to say, I'm a victim. You know, I didn't go to the right school. I've got this wrong with me, that wrong with me. Oh, because of my race, because of my, because I'm a woman, because, oh, I'm a victim, pity me. No, 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 no. We want young people to be told to follow their dreams. And that's what Molly May was saying. Yes, of course some people have more advantages than others. Some are born into more wealth. Some have higher IQs. But what she's really saying is, if you work hard, take a chance and have a dream, you might achieve it. Even if you don't achieve it, the idea that you never gave something a go in your life, you'd never forgive yourself for it. You know, I had a good business. I had a good business, young family, you know, played golf at weekends, did all the sort of quite normal things. Uh, for somebody, you know, from where I live and my background, and I gave it all up and took a massive risk doing the politics. Financial risk, reputational risk, but I knew that if I hadn't done it at that moment, it would never come along again. And I knew I'd go to my deathbed regretting, mm. not following the passion, 
that I had, and that I think is what Molly May was all about. Mm. She even caveated respecting different people of different upbringings. Mm. I, I thought it was, yeah, I agree with you. Mm. Um, okay, so we've got probably two minutes to right. give you a, a minute's exchange. So let's do yep. 15 to 20 seconds yep. per answer. Okay. Um, politicians Joe Cox in 2016 and Sir David Ames in 2021 were both murdered. How has your life changed since these awful incidents? Oh, my life changed before that. Uh, you know, when the left wing hate mob, um, even last Friday, I did a, B I did a BBC Radio 4 question, um, any questions program, there was a mob there, screaming mob, and it was all about me, nobody else. So I've had to learn to live with it. Coming into this building today with you, I was very cautious about when I got out of the car yeah. and came in. It's the way it is. Um, I've had to learn to live with it. I've been controversial. I've taken on the, I've taken on the status quo, and for that, they've got me marked as a devil. It's yeah. not fair, really, but it's the way it is. Do you care if people hate you? No. Why not? Why should I? Lots of people like me. <laughs> <laughs> Do you, what about when you go home though, and when you lay your head on the pillow and you think of all these people? It doesn't I, bother you at all? I don't think about them. No. Do you know what? The truth of it is, the number of people that actually hate me is a very narrow group of hard left, lo mostly London or Bristol or big city. They're a very, very small minority. What I get every day out there, every day out there, people say, do you know what, Mr. Farage? I didn't agree with you, but well done you for you know, doing what you did and, and for fighting for what you believe in. That's how democracy should work. Mm. I don't hate people on the other side. I don't hate people on the left. Of course I don't, mm. with different points of view. We need to get back to actually understanding that what our grandfathers and great-grandfathers fought for and sacrificed so much for was for us to have the right to disagree, but to do so in a civilized manner and respect each other as human beings. And that's really, really important. Mm. So. In maybe 15 seconds or less then, people who are experiencing criticism and hate and it's hurting them, what guidance would you give to them? Pour a drink, ignore it, keep going. <laughs> that may be the best one we've had yet. <laughs> um, what's your legacy, Nigel? How will history remember Nigel Farage? Oh, Mr. Brexit. They'll remember me for being Brexit. They'll remember me, that they'll say Farage. I mean, Mark Francois, Tory MP, wrote a, wrote a book the other week. He said, if Nigel Farage had never been born, we, never, we would never have even discussed Brexit. Has it worked? We've got our freedom back. The question now, what do we do with it? And on that note, if you don't risk anything, you risk everything. Nigel, it's been an absolute pleasure. I've loved it. Thank you so much. Thank you. And we've got you out one minute on time. Well done, you! <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Let me know what you think in the comments. What did you agree with? What did you disagree with? What did you enjoy? And would you like more kind of content like this from me? Some of the content in this discussion was either too controversial to post in the public domain or would risk getting a shadow banned or cancelled. So what we've done is we've taken a portion of the discussion and behind the scenes discussion with Nigel and I before and after air, and we've put it on the rob.team platform. Also, the link is in the description, so go join now. If you enjoyed this content, and even if you didn't, make sure you like the video, hit the subscribe button and turn on the notification bell. And remember this, if you don't risk anything, you risk everything.